understand. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. As uh, Brother Jeff mentioned, our ministry, Baptist Couriers for Christ, uh, it's a literature distribution ministry. Uh, we have been involved with them for uh, consistently since 1987. Prior to that, I worked on a printing press. Our church has a ministry where we print Bibles, New Testaments, John Romans, and have the equipment to put them all together. And uh, so I learned how to print because before I was saved, uh, I did not have a occupation that goes with Christianity. Uh, I had at one time worked as a little bit as a carpenter with my dad. And from there, I went into the army and uh, Cheryl and I met on a helicopter pad in Vietnam. We were both in the army. She was an officer. I had to salute her. <laughs> and I was enlisted, but we both, we, we met because we both worked in the operating room. And uh, her job was to make sure that all the instruments and everything that was needed for the surgery was ready and prepared. My job was to pass the instruments to the doctor as the surgery was going on. So because of that, she was actually my boss for, uh, for a couple of months. So we met, in, we met in Vietnam. We were kind of friends. Uh, I get transferred from Vietnam. I go to Germany, and I'm there for, uh, for 16 months. And there's a phone call, and it's uh, her getting a hold of somebody in the hospital that knew where I was. And we met again. I didn't even recognize her. When I knew her in Vietnam, her hair was blonde. When I saw her in Germany, her hair was black. <laughs> I had to, it took, I recognized her friend, but I didn't recognize her. Anyway, we, we knew each other in, uh, in Germany for about three weeks. And on a whim, just why not, I asked her if she would marry me. <laughs> We don't know each other. We don't know each other's family. I mean, we, it was, oh, let's get married. If we can get married, that'll be a good thing. We have told our children, don't ever do what mom and dad did. That was, that was not a good idea. But we got married in 1971, but neither one of us were saved. Uh, we both kind of grew up going to church, but it was the kind of church where, they baptize you as a baby, and so, okay, you are, you are good. And uh, the one thing about going to church is I did learn a lot of stories in the Bible. I did know that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, but nobody explained to me that it was a personal relationship. So I'm baptized as a baby. I'm good. I, I go when I become a teenager. I go through confirmation classes. Uh, they're going to ask me a couple of questions at the, at the end of that. If I can answer the questions, then uh, now I can take communion, and now I'm responsible for my own spirituality before the Lord. And uh, that's what I lived on. And it, uh, by the time I was 19, 17, I graduated from school, and I took off literally running. I, I left home and just went to to do all kinds of bad things that people that are not saved do. And uh, it was a long, dead-end road when, when uh, we got saved. I was Lutheran, she was Catholic. Nah, neither one of us were very impressed with the church, so we just started kind of looking for a church and ended up in all kinds of cult situations and then just stopped looking for church. And then, uh, long story short, uh, our babysitter was a Christian, and uh, Cheryl, our first daughter, was born, and Cheryl said, we need to be in church. We, we are now responsible for another person. And so through that, we began to search after God. Cheryl got saved in, let me see, I wrote this down. Cheryl got saved in 1975. I, I prayed a prayer. She gets saved. Her life drastically begins to change. We're already separated. 
were in the process of getting a divorce the night that she got saved. We were that close to completely being apart. And uh, she asked me if I would move back home. And so we began to uh, work on our marriage a little bit. And uh, she talked me into going to a, a Bible preaching uh, service. And I heard, for the first time I heard, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how he died for me. And then how I needed to trust him and believe in him to wash away my sins and to forgive me. And so it, it was a good message. And afterwards, a man talked to me and he said, Larry, you don't want to go to hell, do you? Well, nobody that's thinking right was, wants to go to hell. And so I said, no. And he says, well, this is what you need to do. You need to pray this prayer. So, as a good religious Lutheran, he said the words, I said the words. He said the words, I said the words. He said the words, I said the words. And he said, amen. But there was no heart change. There was no life change. Uh, nothing changed other than I prayed a prayer. And so it took four more years before I actually became a believer and trusted Christ. So she lived with an unsaved husband for those years. And uh, our life, even during that, was very in a lot of turmoil, a lot of trouble, a lot of me living for myself and she trying to keep our, our home and our children together. And uh, it was a very difficult time. And what I'm going to bring to you in just a few minutes is what changed my life. Jesus Christ changed my life, but it was the Bible. It was the Bible. Reading the Bible every day is what really changed my life. So we get saved. I go to Bible college. I learn about the Bible. I said, Lord, what would you want me to do? And I always felt like the Lord wanted me to be a missionary, but I didn't know where. And uh, we ended up, because I learned how to print, I ended up in the printing ministry. And that's how I came to know about the Curious for Christ ministry that's out of our church. And so I, I have a, a couple of notes here. We have printed, uh, I had a couple of notes. We have printed over 1 million Bibles that have been distributed throughout Russia and Eastern Europe. We, we have taken people like uh, Jeff and Grace. We'll have 25 to 30 people who will come with us for two weeks. And we will go to a city like Sophia, and we will spend a week, uh, a week and a half out on the street passing out the John Romans with an invitation to come to a preaching service so people that are curious, that are interested, say, I, I'm not sure what that is all about, but let's go to that. And then many times it's the first time they ever hear the gospel. So we have been in uh, 36 different cities and 14 different countries uh, doing this literature distribution and then continuing to work with people like Jeff and Grace who say, okay, we are here, we've learned the language, but we need some help. And uh, the help usually comes through, we have a book or we have a track that is ready to be produced. And so they will call us and we will make arrangements to be able to have that printed so that they have more material to be able to give to people. But then we also make sure, and I notice that you have Bibles over here. Uh, the, the, the Bibles, the, the, the Bulgarian Bibles that you have, I'm not patting myself on the back, but the Bulgarian Bibles that are here is because we went to several churches and said, can you help us? I'm not a rich man. Uh, the men that I work with are not rich. People think sometimes because you come from America, everybody is rich. No, we have a big God. And there's a lots of believers in Baptist churches that want to help other countries and other missionaries to be able to get the gospel to people to, uh, so that they will know how to be saved and have their sins forgiven. And many times we say, you know, the, the, uh, the need is very great, but people will they'll either get saved or they won't get saved. The need is very great, and we need to tell people. So that's what we have been doing this summer. Uh, we will have a small group that is going to Zagreb, Croatia, to be able to help start another Bible study there. We were there four years ago. 
And uh, we have another group that uh, you know, um, one month later that will be going to, uh, to Turin, Poland, to be able to help start a new Baptist church there. And then in September, we have another small group that will be going to Berlin, Germany, to help be able to expand a, a work there and get another Bible study started. So this is our life. Uh, Cheryl and I have been married for 50 years. 50 years. For us to be able to get, to, to stay together that long was God. It took us working on our marriage, but God is the one that has kept our marriage together because uh, we've, we've had many troubles, many challenges. We have five children, all married. We have 17 grandchildren. Wow. The Lord has been very has been very good to us. So that, that's kind of who we are. That's kind of what where we came from and how we got involved with the ministry. In Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 13, it says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That but by love serve one another is the principle behind our Couriers for Christ ministry. There's people here, there's missionaries here, there's national pastors in these countries that we come alongside of them and say, what do you need to for us to be, how can we help you reach your people and your country? But by love, serve one another. I'm not a missionary that comes and stays in a country. I, I, I only speak English. I, I've learned a little bit of other languages, but I cannot function in Bulgaria very well without Google Translate <laughs> or, or Jeff. Uh, so because we have traveled to uh, 14 different countries, okay, what language will I learn to be able to go to these 14 different countries? And because we're only there for a short time to be able to help serve somebody who's there, uh, and next year we will be someplace else. And, and so that is kind of how the ministry has come about. But this, but by love, serve one another is a principle that helped our marriage. Up until that point, I was serving myself. You, I, I love my wife. We are married. She is a good cook. She washes my clothes. She takes care of the house. She takes care of the children. But I am my own man. I have my own work. I have my own job. And we would do things together with the children and everything like that. But I was not, we were not serving each other. She was serving me, but I was not serving her. So this principle of what by love serve one another works between a husband and a wife. It works between children and parents when they learn to honor and respect uh, the parents. And we as parents take time to instruct and teach our children it works, it, it helps in a workplace. I don't know what anybody does for, for work to put food on the table. But if you go to work for a company and you have this idea of by love, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to help my company. I'm going to help my boss to be successful. When we serve other people, many times God will bless us. Because we're trying to be a help to somebody else. It's kind of the expanded version of do unto others as you would want others to do unto you. It's just the New Testament example of that. So that's that's kind of the basis of our ministry. That's the basis for our marriage. That's the basis that we've tried to live, uh, live together. I'm wanting you to follow me along in the Bible today. Turn back to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1 and in verse 6 it says, And he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Well, let's start in verse 5. Excuse me. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins. So that's talking about uh, 
Wash us from our sins in his own blood. So it's talking to people that are believers, people that are saved, uh, who loved us and washed us from our sin and have made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Turn over to chapter 5, chapter 5 and verse 9. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So it's talking about people that have been saved, redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Even though I have wanted, my desire has been to become a missionary to a particular country. Lord, would you have me come and, and learn Bulgarian and to find a place in Bulgaria where I can stay and I can learn the language and I can try and get the gospel, tell people how to be saved there. Or Lord, would it be in Russia or would it be in the Ukraine or would it be in the Czech Republic? Lord, where is it that you would have me to be? And he said, no, no, I want you to be involved in literature and Bibles and getting Bibles to people and the pastors and the missionary and the church people will be able to get that up. But it's going to go into every, let me read that again, uh, out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nations. We've not reached the world with the gospel yet. Everybody doesn't know that Jesus Christ died for them. And so that's our where we're headed. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And then in verse 10, again it says, and, had made, and hast made us in our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth, talking about the future. So twice it tells us just in the book of Revelation that when we become a Christian, when we become a believer, we become in God's sight a king and a priest. Well, what does a king and a priest do? Turn back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 17. For the most part, no matter what your religious background is, we know what a priest does. A priest takes care of God's things. A priest takes care of, uh, of the preaching, or he does the sacraments, or he a priest does spiritual things. So I'm not going to cover that. Well, what is the king supposed to do? If we become... Uh, kings and priests, what was the king supposed to do? So I, as I'm reading my Bible, I'm thinking about this, and in Deuteronomy chapter 17, it tells me what God expected the king to do. Uh, in verse 14, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me like as all the other nations that are above me. Thou shalt in any wise set him a king over thee, whom thou, Lord thy God, shall choose. In other words, God was supposed to choose the king. Uh, this is for the nation of Israel, but God was going to choose their king. One from a, among thy brethren shalt thou set a king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. So he says, I will help you choose a king. And, uh, but it's, it has to be one of you, not one of somebody else. I wish, I wish that we had men that were saved men that we could vote for. But we don't have that today. Pick a country. We just don't have that today. I, I wish that in America we could have voted for a Christian. But we've not been able to vote for a Christian for years because nobody has run. And it's the same same thing in other in other countries. It's the world that we live in. Verse 16. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause people to return to Egypt. To the end he shall not multiply horses, for as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. David was a good king. Solomon's son, no, he's multiplying horses. He's back in Egypt which would be the equivalent of it. He's going back to the world, just like when we get saved, we come out of the world. We live in the world, but we're, we, we don't practice worldly principles. He goes back to the world. 
Verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives. How long? David had, or not David, uh, David had three wives, four wives. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines or something like that. He's not listening to God. Why? That his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply himself silver and gold. So, okay, this is the things that a king is not supposed to do. He's not to have several wives. He's not supposed to go back to the world. He's not supposed to be just focused on silver and gold. Verse 18, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest, the Levite. So he was supposed to the king, when he gets uh, it becomes king, he's supposed to go to the priest and say, okay, give me all of the laws that God has. And I'm going to write them down for myself so that I know how I'm supposed to watch over and to guide and direct the people. When I was in Bible college, we had a man, one of my teachers, that said, your assignment this year is to write by hand in ink the entire Gospel of John. Do you know how many chapters are in the book of John? In a, so I didn't raise my hand in class, but I waited until after the class, and I said, excuse me, sir, but I'm married. I have, at that time, four children. I'm working a full-time job. I'm trying to go to Bible college at the same time. I don't have time to write out the whole book of John. Can I take the book of Mark? It's much shorter. <laughs> and he says, no. He says, I want you to write it out uh, by pen with no mistakes, the whole book of John. Okay. I can't use the computer, so I have to have a pen. And when I made a mistake, I had to tear it up and throw it away, just like they did in the Old Testament. It taught me of the, about the work that goes into just having a copy of the Word of God. But he did that so that he would know how to rule over the people. Verse 19, And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. Uh, for those that have a Bulgarian Bible, I'm not sure how that translates. If it says in there that he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep all his words and this law and these statutes. But that was the first time that I really saw that the king was supposed to read the his portion of the Bible every day, all the days of his life. So I've been a Christian for four or five years. I occasionally read my Bible. I read my Bible for college classes. I read my Bible to, if pastor asks me if I will teach in our, teach our children, so I read my Bible so that I have a story that I can tell them or I can tell them more about God. But to read my Bible every day, it took me several years before I saw, because I hear my pastor say, you need to read your Bible every day. Yes, yes, yes. But that, I, I don't have time. I don't know how many times I heard that, but when I began to read that in my Bible, he shall read therein all the days of his life. Maybe I should obey the Bible. Maybe I will learn more about God. Maybe I will become a better Christian. Maybe I will become a better person if I start reading my Bible every day. Turn over to uh, Deuteronomy. Well, that's time is fleeting. Time is racing away. Turn in your Bible to Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, I don't know if it's, if it's laid out the same in Bulgarian, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, Joshua verse, chapter 1, verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then 
thou shalt have good success. So not only does the Bible tell me in one spot in Deuteronomy to read my Bible every day, but it, here it says I'm supposed to think about it twice a day, mm -hmm. in the morning and in the evening. Oh, I don't, how much time do I have in a day? We always have enough time to do what we want to do. I am too tired to shovel the sidewalk outside because of all the snow. No, we have time to do what we want to do. Uh, the Lord says, to follow me, to be a good believer, you need to read your Bible. I have, I have five more verses, which we will not look at, to talk about the importance of reading your Bible every day. It's all throughout the Bible. There's, there's verses in Psalms. There's verses in Proverbs. One of the things that I learned that to me is very helpful. If, if people would just read the Bible, it would make a big difference in their life. Yes. If, I don't know about you, I don't know if you've ever tried to read through your Bible. Genesis, oh, very interesting. We know where we come from. It's not millions and millions and millions and millions of years and then this amoeba call, crawls out of the water. And then millions and millions and millions of years. And pretty soon it has lungs in its legs. And more millions and millions and millions of years. And then it's able to stand up straight and able to start things. And more millions of years go by and learns how to use fire and cook food. Foolishness. Just absolutely foolishness that, uh, that people today still believe that. But that's what's taught in all the schools, including... In the, uh, in the United States, my question to those people are, okay, if that took millions and millions and millions for all that, think about this. Where did all the different colored flowers come from? Where did all the different kinds of wheat and rye and corn and where did all the different seeds come from? Where did the fruit trees come from? A orange is not like an apple, and neither one of them are even close to a coconut. Right. <laughs> millions and millions. No. It, Genesis. If we would read the book of Genesis, if we would read the book of Psalms, if we would work, read the book of Proverbs. Proverbs tells us how to live everyday life. Yes. A, an unsaved businessman, if he would read the book of Proverbs, would be a good businessman. Right. Because there's good principles in there. Uh, for us as Christians, we certainly should be reading the New Testament because that is written to us. The whole Bible is for us, but the New Testament was all about Jesus Christ, what he told them, and then the disciples, they continue to say, here's some more things that you need to do. The more we read our Bible, the more that we know about God. So there it talks about meditating, thinking on the Word of God day and night. For me, that is a struggle. So one of the ways that I help myself to think about God is I have good Christian music that I listen to. I was asking Jeff, is there a, is there a, I knew the answer, but is there a Christian radio station here in Bulgaria, here in Sofia, that you can turn on and hear good Christian music? We are blessed. We are blessed for those of us who know English and understand it, that there are good, there are good, are good music. There is good music that, that comes out of, the, out of the hymn book and things that will help me through my day to think about God. Now, when the driver cuts in front of me. <laughs> that never happens here. When the driver cuts in front of me, my first response usually is, well, thank you, Lord, for saving me and protecting me. No, my first response usually is, you idiot. <laughs> you didn't see me with my lights on. But here's the music playing in the background that's reminding me, okay, I am a believer. I need to have a good heart. I need to have the right attitude. I need to be more Christian in my actions. And so sometimes it helps my tongue and my attitude. Turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. 
when people begin to read their Bible, they will read through Genesis, they'll read through Exodus. Oh, this is very interesting. Genesis, Exodus, and then you get to Leviticus, and it's all about the sacrifices, and it's all about uh, taking the sheepskins and the goatskins and all the stuff that they're going to do, and when you, when a person is sick, what they're supposed to do. And you get in Leviticus and you say, this is not very interesting. But uh, we, we had uh, two people here last Sunday that were in medical school. And I'm in the book of Leviticus right now for my regular, I read, uh, I'm reading Old Testament, a Psalm, a Proverb, and then two verses of the New Testament every day. Well, in Leviticus, they were talking about medical things, and I'm thinking, if I, well, what were their names? They were, they were, uh, that was Sarah and Owen. Yeah, if I was Sarah and Owen, and I'm reading in Leviticus, I'd say, oh, God had some medicine and some things that we should do clear back then in the Old Testament that we still practice today. That when you when you find somebody who is sick and you take care of them, one of the things you're supposed to do is, the Bible says go and wash your clothes and to take a bath, but I at least need to know, I need to wash my hands right. because I might be carrying. Anyway, there's lots of things that we can learn. But we get here to... Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. And he said, and he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. I love being in Bulgaria. Some of the best bread in the world is in this country. We, we were at the store the other day, and here's nine or ten different kinds of bread Jeff goes over to the meat section, and he's drooling, and he gets hungry. I go to the bread section, and I start drooling and getting hungry. I love the, the different kinds of bread. But he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is repeated again over in Luke chapter 4, verse 4. So he says, I'm, I'm telling you that everything that Jesus Christ had to say, everything that's written in the Bible... That is very important. It's just as important as us eating food. Turn over to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. As I mentioned, I have lots of verses that I could give you, but this is not a college class. <laughs> and uh, we need to be conscious of the time but in Acts chapter 17, Paul is Paul and Silas are in the, the city of Thessalonica, which is not that far from here. Last time we were in Bulgaria, we, we went down there to, to visit. There was a church at one time in Thessalonica. You can't find hardly anything down there today that is preaching the gospel. But they, they go to Thessalonica and they are preaching and Paul reasons with them out of the scriptures it says in verse 2, opening and alleging that Christ, verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks a great multitude and of the chief, chief women not a few. But then we come down here through verse 5 and 6 and 7, and they get all upset because, uh, because of the preaching. So they end up having to leave there, and they go to Berea, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily, whether those things are so. The importance of not only coming to church with your Bible, but listening to what Brother Jeff has to say. Is what he is telling me, is that true? That's why I have people follow along in the Bible. I take notes. Joe, can I have my... When I come to church, no matter where I am, not just when I'm at home and listening to my own pastor preach, I take notes on every message that I hear. Uh, I started this notebook 
in August of 2019. And I, I only have just a couple pages left. I have seven of these that goes back. Uh, last time I looked, goes all the way back to... Uh, uh, I just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it goes. Uh, it goes back twenty years, but they sit on the shelf. So why take notes? If I'm, because every once in a while I will take those, take these down, and I will read things from the past. Or Cheryl and I will be talking about something, or I will hear somebody say something, a Bible verse, and I want to, pastor talked about that. Let me go back. Let me remember. My I am. 73 years old. My memory is sliding away. I forget. But I can go back and say, Pastor talked about that just two weeks ago. Let me go back and read again of, of what he said when he was talking about the peace that God gives. So I take, I take notes on every message to help me learn, to help me focus when Pastor's preaching on what he is saying. So I'm not just, so I'm not just sitting there and thinking, oh, here I am. He is still talking. Does he know what time it is? Uh, oh, it's still snowing outside. Oh, the cars are going by. This, oh, it's going to be kind of wet when I go. You know, I'm kind of hungry, and it's been, I haven't eaten anything. For, no, I, I make myself pay attention on purpose so that I learn and uh, what... My pastor is teaching as well as reading the Bible for myself. What did these men do? They were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. There's another example that just one uh, second that I have given you of, of eight different examples of being in the Bible every single day. Day. Turn over to, you're not done yet. No, I'm not done yet. <laughs> Turn over to Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 3. Yeah. It was in my Bible earlier. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The value, the value of being able to have a good song. It not only helps me have a right mindset, it, it reinforces what I'm reading in the Bible. It reinforces who God is. Uh, turn in, turn <laughs> in your songbook, uh, it is well with my soul. It is number... Turn to... Uh, uh, number 410. When was the last time Jeff preached out of the song? <clears throat> this song is, is one of my favorite songs. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That tells me that no matter what I'm going through, in, whether it's in sickness, trouble on the job, world politics. It, I'm, I'm sad to see what's taking place in Ukraine, but how other countries are, are involved. But... When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, one of the things that Cheryl and I have talked about recently is I'm 73, she's also in her 70s. Our days are numbered. We're not going to be around for another 20, 30, 40 years. 
Oh, we've been in good health all this time, but one day, one day we will go to the doctor and he will say, I'm sorry, but you have, or here's your situation, or whatever. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. How can I say it is well with my soul unless I know that I'm a Christian? that I've gotten saved, that I've been living for the Lord, that I know about Him because I've been reading my Bible. Verse 2, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, we all have trials. No matter who we are, male or female, young or old, we all have trials. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded, in other words, he's thought of it, Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. No matter how bad, no matter what goes wrong down here, it's well with my soul because one day I'm not going to be here. One day I'm going to. We all want, a, we all want perfect weather. We all want perfect peace. We want, all want to be happy. It's not going to happen until we get to eternity. We can work on it down here, but but here's verse three, as he, as the, uh, as the writer of the song here, here Horatio Spafford was writing, he says, "My sin." Notice that there's a dash. My sin is like he was writing my sin, and he stops to think, and he just puts a dash in my sin. Oh, I remember what it was like before I got saved. I didn't get saved till I was thirty-one. I had. A lot of sin. I try not to dwell on my past. I try not to think about what my life was like in the past because it was terrible. My sin, he thinks about it. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, has all been washed away, is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. That song speaks to my heart every time I sing it or read it. When COVID came and closed down the world, we ended up having to stay home because we couldn't meet in services. And so after a couple of weeks, pastors started doing the internet. And so we were able to watch it. Watching, watching preaching, watching pastor talking is not the same as being in the same room. I, you got that eyeball to eyeball contact. But that first Sunday that we were finally able to all be back in church and to just sing the songs together, to see my friends sitting in the, in the uh, seat next to me, to see my friends that sit in front of me, to see my friends that sit behind me. I just started crying because it was so good to be back in church. Oh, how God has blessed us by not only being saved, but we have the fellowship of other believers. We have a Bible that we can read and understand that he tells us how much he loves us. And then we have the, uh, the fellowship of just being able to sit around and talk. I have enjoyed, I have enjoyed our fellowship. Uh, Kevin came over last night, so I got to know Kevin a little bit more. Uh, we, I've had a chance to talk to a, a couple of you, and uh, I, it's one of the things I like about traveling that no matter what country I go to, when I get to a country and I go to church with some people who are believers, we always have something in common. We may not be able to speak one another's language which I can't in most other countries. I can't speak their language, but our hearts speak one to another. Mm -hmm. We're able to rejoice. Uh, I'm singing Alleluia, and they're singing Alleluia. Now, those are the only words that are the same. <laughs> <laughs> My sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Uh, several more verses turn back to turn back to John chapter 20 and I will close there it's actually it's actually a two part message 
Just imagine what, when, when Jeff asked, he says, will, will, you, uh, will you speak at church? I very quickly said, no, because I know how, how long it takes to work through a, an interrupter, not an interpreter, an interrupter. And so everything takes twice as long. But John chapter 20 and verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye, may, ye might have life through his name. The only ones that I really know in here, in this room, are my wife and Jeff and Grace. I see you, I know you a little bit. I would like, if it's okay with you, I'd like to take a picture of you all before we leave, just so I can remember. Okay, Jeff, who is the who is the couple who was sitting in the front row? <laughs> but it also will not only help me to remember you, but it will help us to pray for you. But I don't know what your spiritual condition is. You are in church. Wait a minute, Larry. This is church? No, church is this great big building with a cross and a priest with all kinds of rope. No. Church is the people. It's not the building. Right. So sometimes when it's a new church, a new work getting started, we have a hard time saying, well, we, we meet in a small room. <laughs> but it helps us to remember who you are. Remember the, the beginnings of the church, Bible, Bible Baptist Church, that started. We were able to come over and meet some of the first people who were gathering together. But the big question is, do you know that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Not are you coming to church, not are you singing the song, not are you, are you opening a, a Bible, but are you saved? Are you born again? As it talks about in John chapter 3, verse 3, you must be born again. How sad to go through life to attend a Bible preaching church and end up, oh, I, I believe all that, I believe all that, yeah, that's good. But we never trust Christ before. It would be a very sad day when we stand before the Lord and find out, oh, you know what? So and so didn't make it. They, they were really nice people, but they never trusted Christ. I thank Jeff for the opportunity to be able to speak to you. Like I said, I would like to get a picture of you all before uh, before we leave so I can remember to pray for you and, and say, how is, how is Brother Kenneth these days? <laughs> or, you know, just what, what what is going on with their life? Will you take time? Will you set aside time every day to start reading your Bible? I'm not asking you to do the same kind of reading that I'm doing, where I read three chapters in the Old Testament, and then I read one of the Psalms, and then I read uh, the, out of the book of Proverbs, a chapter in Proverbs, and then I read two or three chapters of the New Testament. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to read all the way through your Bible in one year, or you can do it in, in, in uh, about 20, 25 minutes a day. I'm saying, will you read your Bible? Say, Lord, speak to my heart. Help me to grow spiritually. Help me to grow mentally. Help me to have, by love, serve one another. Lord, I don't want to just have a job or a house or a family. I want us to all be together. I want us all to be of the same mind. I want us to all be of the same heart. Where we're trying our best to please you with your life, no matter what job you have, no, what, no matter what kind of marital status you have or whatever, get to know the Lord. And the only way you're going to do that is by spending time in your Bible. Father, I thank you for this time you've given to us to be able to meet together, to get to, new, uh, get to meet new people, and to uh, one day hear about what's going on and what has happened in their lives. Lord, we ask you would watch over us. Give us wisdom for decisions that we need to make. Lord, give us wisdom and desire 
to read our Bible every day to learn more about you, that we might be pleasing unto you, that we might learn of the promises that you've set aside for us of things not only in the future, but promises for this life also, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life. But Lord, when the times of trouble, the times of trial, the times of uh, difficulties come, that we know that we can rely on you to give us grace and strength and peace. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.